Please be aware, in this podcast series, we talk about all areas of safeguarding, which some people may find upsetting. So please make sure you're okay listening to today's topic. Be mindful of those around you, such as children, that you might not want to listen in. Hi, I'm SSS Safeguarding Director Sam Preston. And I'm former head teacher and content author Sarah Spinks. One of the most frequent topics I've been asked about this academic year is about the use of schools for out of hours, that's non-school activities, mainly focusing on whose responsibility is it to provide designated safeguard and lay DSL cover. So the statutory guidance, Keeping Children Safe in Education, KCSIE, this year introduced a duty on schools to have procedures in place to deal with safeguarding allegations that occurred when an individual or organisation um, is using the school premises for non-school activities for children, which incidentally also applies to vulnerable adults. So, Sarah, what does KCSIE actually specify? Yeah, you're right, Sam. This year's version of KCSIE does include statutory guidance for out-of-hours school cover, and it can be found in Annex C, which focuses on the role of the uh, designated safeguarding lead. And the guidance says, during term time, the designated safeguarding lead or deputy should always be available during school or college hours for staff in the school or college to discuss any safeguarding concern. Whilst generally speaking, the designated safeguarding lead or a deputy would be expected to be available in person, it is a matter for individual schools and colleges working with a designated safeguarding lead to define what available means and whether in exceptional circumstances, availability by a phone and or Skype or other such media is acceptable. It is a matter for the individual schools and colleges and the designated safeguarding lead to arrange adequate and appropriate cover arrangements for any out of hour or out of term activities. Right, blimey. So that's Mm. that's that's a lot, but schools have got to unpick this, haven't they? So Mm. right, let's just be, be clear. When services or activities taking place on school premises are provided under the direct supervision or management of school staff, school's own safeguarding policy and procedures will apply in relation to any safeguarding concerns or allegations. But when activities are run by community groups, sports associations or other service providers, any non-employed provider of extracurricular activities, there needs to be specific arrangements in place Yeah. So where services or activities are not under the direct supervision of management of the school, the school is required to seek assurances that the individual or organisation has appropriate safeguarding and child protection policies and procedures in place. They will also need to ensure that there are arrangements in place for the individual or organisation to liaise with the school on safeguarding matters where appropriate. Um, This duty applies regardless of whether or not children who attend any of these services or activities are on the school roll. That's right, Sam. Yeah. So schools will need to specify in their safeguarding policy what the expected procedures are if services are being provided on school site by external people or organisations. So what should they consider? Well, I think firstly, they must clarify if the external provider has an awareness of safeguarding issues and if they or their organisation has protocols in place, you know, such as reporting allegations or incidents, etc. Yeah, but we need to be really clear here, though, under KCSIE, the school still has the requirement to inform the local authority designated officer, the LADO, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, for example, Say it's agreed that should a concern occur, the provider will contact the LADO. School must contact the LADO to check the referral has been made. Okay, so this is where the availability of schools DSL or their deputy comes in, isn't it? So that provider must have a school point of contact to also to report the issue to. 
Yeah, that's right. So the obligations in KCSE are clear that the school is required to inform the LADO in the usual way. And as part of carrying out this duty, the school is likely to be processing personal data about individuals with whom they have no relationship. So schools should aim to ensure that this duty to inform the LADO and any other relevant agency is clearly referenced in any written agreement. So the duty to inform the LADO in this context should override any data protection concerns and schools are able to rely on their legal obligations under KCSA, i.e., sorry, in this regard. So does this still apply if the external organisation has their own DSL? Yeah. So depending on the size of the organisation, they may also be required to appoint a suitably trained DSL and deputy DSL. However, the statutory requirement for the school reporting is still mandatory. The school may also need to ensure that the organisation or body responsible for the non-school activity contacts the ladder if required. As part of any safeguarding allegation, there should always be a lessons learned process on conclusion to see if the school should take steps to prevent or mitigate future risk. You know, this may include amending policies, procedures and any contractual arrangements. And it's often a part of a conversation with the LADO. Uh, you know, this should be included as part of any review process under this element of the KCSIE. OK, so we've been through the guidance and put some key pointers for schools to consider. Could you talk us through them and maybe let's start with lease and hire agreements? Yeah, we advise schools, you know, to review any lease or hire agreements currently in place. Agreements may require updating to include assurances that the hiring organisation has, you know, appropriate safeguarding and child protection policies and agreements from the hiring organisation that the school may inspect these as appropriate. You know, the school needs to undertake appropriate pre-employment checks for all staff and volunteers, such as the appropriate level of criminal record checks, you know, disclosure and barring service DBS checks, including the children barred list check, you know, check where relevant for the roles. Um, we need to make sure that the companies have uh, conducted their own risk assessments based on the organisation's activities and that they'll provide first aid supplies that relate to the risk assessment, if not provided by the school. You know, the lease or hire agreement should also require the organisation in, in the event that an allegation is made relating to an incident that occurred whilst using the school premises to notify the school's DSL or DDSL uh, within a specific time frame. And that the organisation may also be required to notify the LADO and any other relevant agencies. So before agreeing new um, hires, make sure those things are in place. Yeah. OK. So as schools are required to ensure that the, the DSL or the deputy can be contacted and, is, or, you know, is, or is available at um, all times the school premises is in use for children, They'll need to ensure that the DSL or the deputy is available to, to you know, to, to be contacted during these times and also to specify how that will happen. They've got to specify that in the policy and within the lease and hire agreement. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it's about ensuring the mechanisms for contact are really clear and understood. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's where there might be some confusion, actually. You know, mm. yeah, the DSL or the deputy or deputies will not necessarily need to be on the premises during this period, but schools will need to consider an appropriate method for contact, you know, whether that's by telephone or email, and ensure that the method for contacting the DSL or DDSL is clearly communicated in that hiring organ, for, you know, to the hiring organisation. So in the event of an allegation or a concern that's reported by the hiring organisation to the school, they should follow their own safeguarding policy and procedures which should include informing the LADO in certain circumstances. But even when um, even when the hiring organisation has notified the LADO, they must also notify the school DSL or, or deputy. And you know, and you know, it's it's not an either or here, is it? Yeah. No. And that enables then the school to confirm with the LADO that that contact or the referral has been made. Absolutely. And finally, it should be made clear to the hiring organisation that all these safeguarding requirements are conditions of use and occupation of the premises and that failure to comply with these will lead to a termination of the hire or lease agreement. You know, schools may wish to contact their legal advisors 
assistance when reviewing any lease arrangements to make sure that all these things are clearly in their agreements. Yeah, yeah. So in essence, to meet the new statutory requirements, schools must plan, ensure there's a DSL or deputy to cover, um, that they're available and how this cover can be contacted. Mm. You need to communicate this with the external providers. Mm. And they need to specify the reporting expectations. It's getting those expectations clearly understood before services commence. And that um, that's reporting to the LADO and to school and have that within the lease agreement and within school policies. So we've talked a lot about referral to the LADO. During core working hours, often the DSL uses their discretion. I mean, I know I certainly did as to whether referrals were made to the LADO. However, as those are accessing out of school provision, you know, that you know, the, the, those accessing the provision might not be known, and certainly their family situations might not be known to the DSL. I think I would be saying I would always recommend LADO referral. Would you agree, Sarah? Absolutely agree. And I know just from my experience um, that I always ensured that I had, you know, obviously a DSL in school, but a number of DDSLs so that during holidays, there was a real clarity about who was on duty when throughout that holiday period with really clear contact information that was shared with the hirer. So I completely agree. If in doubt, those companies must always inform the ladder. They're better to act than not to act at all. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm, and I'm thinking from this from the school's perspective, just make it very clear that, it, you know, if the expectation is that they will be contacting the LADO directly themselves, the organisations, that they must also contact school and school will always contact the LADO, even if the hirer has said they've already done it, you still have to make that con just to con just to get that confirmation yeah absolutely the right and i process. suppose finally we we must i mean we've we focused quite a bit on on um, contacting the lado the, the the final thing i would say is though that um you know if if what we're talking about is deemed to be um either you know an an, an emergency or an immediate risk Mm. then schools should also be confirming and, and making sure that, that, that those using the premises know that that should be a direct police referral. Absolutely. Emergency services, absolutely. Absolutely.